Archaeologists have discovered hundreds of grave goods in the tomb of a Silla princess, buried in the city of Jeongju, in the north Jeongsang province of South Korea. Silla was a kingdom founded by Bak Hyakjius of Silla, which emerged in 57 BC as one of the three kingdoms of Korea alongside Bek Jengaguryeo. Silla was ruled by the Jeongju Gim dynasty for 586 years, the Miryang Bak Park for 232 years, and the Wulseong Seok for 172 years, until the kingdom's collapse in AD 935, during the reign of the 56th ruler, Jeongsun of Silla. The discovery was made during ongoing excavations by the Jiangyu Division from the National Research Institute of Cultural Heritage NRICH, of tomb number 44 in the coastal city of Jiangyu, the former capital of the Silla Kingdom. Excavations first started in 2014, having identified the tomb within a medium-sized burial mound containing a stone-piled wooden chamber, now absent of human remains, having deteriorated away to dust, which archaeologists believe dates from the 5th century AD. The latest discoveries consist of a gilt bronze crown, gold chest ornaments, gold earrings and pendants, gilt bronze ornaments, gold and silver bracelets, an ornamental silver knife, and hundreds of stones from the strategy board game Batik, also called Go. Also, among the grave goods were 50 pieces of mica, a mineral that was believed to be an ingredient for youth and longevity in Taoism. An official from NRICH told the Korea Times. The height of the buried person is estimated to be about 150 centimeters, and the small size of the gilt bronze crown and other accessories indicate that the tomb is for a woman. The person also carried an ornamental silver knife instead of an adorned dagger typically found in king's tombs, suggesting that the person could be female. Alongside the burial were also various golden-edged jeweled beetles used to decorate the deceased. The beetles are normally only found in burials of the Silla royalty or elite, suggesting that the burial, along with the high-status grave goods, was that of a royal Silla princess. A Roman furnace almost 1,500 years old was discovered during excavation works at a construction site in the town of Silistra. According to archaeologists, this is the largest furnace for construction ceramics from the Roman era, discovered in Bulgaria, correspondent of Gnes for the region reports. The facility has a fully preserved combustion chamber. Also preserved is the grill on which the bricks were baked in Roman times. The furnace has two levels. On the lower level there are the two combustion chambers in which the fire that warms the grill was lit. Above the grill is the upper chamber of the furnace. The grill has an area of about 15 square meter, said archaeologist Christian Mihailov. This furnace can take up about 10 to 15 firings and 10 to 15 production cycles of bricks. Keep in mind that the temperature that could be reached in it is about 900 degrees, Prof. Georgi Atanasov said on his part. According to experts, the technology has not differed much from today's way of making bricks. Just like the bricks are made now, in ancient time they were left in the sun in wooden molds so as to prevent them from sticking together. The warm air came out from holes in the chambers with a very high temperature and baked the bricks, Atanasov stressed. In the middle of the 6th century, Roman buildings were built of bricks, and the buildings preserved the spirit of those times. Observing the size of the bricks, looking closely at their decoration, we do not rule out that this furnace produced bricks for the construction of the magnificent castle on the Danube coast of Justinian the Great, erected around 620 to 630, Atanasov also stressed. New type of luminescent rock discovered on shores of Michigan, gem and mineral expert Eric Romanamaki made a life-changing discovery in June of last year. During a nighttime excursion along the shores of Lake Superior, he found rocks that glowed like lava. With the aid of a UV light, he sent the Uprlitz to Michigan Tech University, as well as University of Saskatchewan, where the rocks were confirmed to be a type of cyanite that contained sodalite. Sodalite, usually found in Canada, is what is responsible for the glowing nature of rocks. Sodalite is usually blue, but the rocks in his discovery have been mostly composed of granite or basalt. Geologists have noted that while these stones have technically been discovered already, this is the first time anyone has had them officially tested and confirmed. He has turned his find into a solid business. The 43-year-old Brimley resident sells the stones he finds for over $30 a pound in addition to giving tours of the area where the stones can be found. His social media pages are filled with tour photos and his group finds. 
The Uperlites were named by him after the region they were found in, the Michigan Upper Peninsula, which is colloquially called Uper. The presence of these stones in Michigan has put down in a glacial movement. Before we start, please take a moment to give this video a like, subscribe to Blast World Mysteries, and hit the bell so you'll never miss these great stories. Italian warrior Prince Grave found rich in artifacts. In Coronaldo, in the central Italian province of Ancona, the tomb of a Piscinian warrior prince from the 7th century BC was discovered in July of 2018 with an amazing haul of artifacts. According to the research paper at Cambridge.org, the grave was found when a new sports arena in the Nivola River Valley was at the planning stage. Superintendents of Archeologia Marche and the municipality of Coronaldo allowed Archeonivola, a project of the University of Bologna, to perform a non-invasive aerial survey, geophysical work, and then conduct an archaeological excavation before construction started. After finding the grave, the team used landscape mapping technologies and non-destructive field techniques to reconstruct the Nivola River Valley. The grave covered an area of about a half of an acre of land with three large ring ditches, along with later Roman burials, and may have been surrounded by a moat and covered by a mound. The center of the ring was excavated, and an iron-wheeled war chariot, a bronze helmet, bronze vessels, a large cache of weapons and iron skewers along with other treasures were recovered. The chariot is remarkable because iron was not readily available at the time. An ala, a large ceramic jar imported from ancient Donia, now northern Apulia in the south of Italy, was also found indicating the grave owner was a wealthy, powerful man among his peers. It also speaks of the trade that existed with the Apulian region in the boot heel of Italy on the coast of the Adriatic Sea. Unfortunately, the grave owner is no longer present with some researchers believing that he was buried so close to the surface that his remains have been scattered over the field over hundreds of years of plowing. Some fragments of bone found in the pit will be DNA tested to find out if the deceased was male or female. Archaeologinewsnetwork.com tells us that Federic Abashi, professor of geophysics, applied to archaeology at the University of Bologna, and director of the excavation remarked, it is one of the largest tombs ever found after that of the Piscinian Queen of Sirolo, and it is almost on the northern border of the area inhabited by the Piceni, before the Romans, which included the Marche and part of Abruzzo. The varied types of relics found indicates the associations of the wealthy and powerful along the coat of Italy and is comparable to the Piceni orientalizing necropolises from southern Marche. Archaeologists have found the bones of about 60 mammoths at an airport under construction just north of Mexico City, near human-built traps, where more than a dozen mammoths were found last year. Both discoveries reveal how appealing the area once a shallow lake was for the mammoths, and how erroneous was the classic vision of groups of fur-clad hunters with spears chasing mammoths across a plain. Humans may have been smarter and mammoths clumsier than people had previously thought. For the moment, however, Mexican archaeologists are facing a surfeit of mammoths, almost too many to ever excavate. There are too many, there are hundreds, said archaeologist Pedro Sanchez Nava of the National Institute of Anthropology and History. The excavations were conducted on the shores of an ancient lake, once known as Zoltican and now disappeared. The shallow lake apparently produced generous quantities of grasses and reeds, which attracted mammoths who often ate 150 kilograms, 330 pounds, of the stuff every day. It was like paradise for them Sanchez Nava said. The excavations are about six miles away from the mammoth pits found last year in the hamlet of San Antonio Zawento, there, two human-built pits were dug about 15,000 years ago to trap mammoths, which apparently couldn't clamber out of the six-foot-deep traps. Archaeologists have uncovered the 14th-century castle Ud Harlem near of the Dutch town of Heemskerk. A lost castle destroyed after an extraordinary massacre has been uncovered by stunned archaeologists. The remarkable find was made in a field outside the Dutch town of Heemskerk in what's been called a titanic moment. The site, known as Castle Ud Harlem, stood for only 100 years before its destruction in 1351 and was the site of a grisly bloodbath. When enemies invaded the castle's master fled, leaving behind staff to face a massacre. After it was destroyed the set of ruins enshrouded with a dark history went undisturbed for hundreds of years until now. Archaeologists found the building's remains close to the site of a smaller castle that was unearthed back in the 1960s. 
Back then, archaeologists could see that the smaller castle occupied just one corner of a large square, marked out by ramparts and moats. When they searched the rest of the square, however, they found nothing, and the empty space has remained a mystery ever since. But now, using modern technology, a team of archaeologists has found a second, larger castle within the ramparts. We couldn't believe our luck when discovering this castle, said team member Nancy de John Lamberts. One of our team described it as a titanic moment that moment when you saw the first glimpse of the titanic as it appeared out of the dark. It was a quite similar feeling when we first saw the footprint of the castle emerging on the screen. Mrs. De Jong said Castle Oud Harlem was like a time capsule because the fortress stood for only 100 years before its destruction in 1351, during the Hook and Cod Wars. The battles were fought over the title of Count of Holland, she said. When the enemy approached, the owner of the castle fled, leaving behind his loyal staff waiting for his return. They faced the enemy and an extraordinary map. Stories say that there are mass graves present on the site and that the doomed souls of those who died, there were the reason that the castle site was never redeveloped. Right after the destruction of the castle, they cleared most of the remains. What was left was a hilly meadowland for the past 600 years. The outline of the castle was revealed using a combination of magnetometry and electromagnetic induction, EMI. These techniques can be done without excavating, with the former revealing metal objects, while the latter reveals buried ruins by running an electric current through the earth to measure resistance. Archaeologists suspect that the two castles would have functioned as one complex. This means the ruins found in the 1960s were the inner castle where the lord and his family would have lived. While the newly found ruins are the outer castle, a buffer castle where there would have been stables, craftsmen and servants. The find is particularly significant because it's now the oldest square castle in the Netherlands. Mrs. De Jong said. Finding a new unknown castle is very exciting, but finding an early square castle is extra exciting. Measuring 45 meters by 45 meters means it's quite large for those days. Until recently, Dutch archaeologists assumed that the square castles only occurred after 1280. This newly discovered square castle dates from 1250. This would push back the mainstream archaeological time frame by three decades and makes it the oldest square, tower castle type in the Netherlands. It also would have been the most modern castle in the Netherlands in those days. So far, the team has only probed 60% of the fortified square using EMI, which means there could be more discoveries on the cards. The best is yet to come said Mrs. De Jong. Unprecedented, 7,000-year-old submerged archaeological site found off the coast of Florida. This will forever transform the way we approach offshore archaeology. An ancient burial site belonging to Native America culture has been found under the ocean near Key, Minnesota, Minnesota Key Offshore, MKO, on the west coast of the Florida Peninsula, local Secretary of State Ken Detzner recently announced. The research carried out so far shows that during the early Archaic period, when the sea level was much lower than at present, the area where the K is located was not submerged and there was a small freshwater lake there where the ancient Floridians buried their deceased. The site near the community of Venice was first discovered by an amateur diver in June 2016, who reported the find to the Archaeological Research Office BAR pointing towards the existence of possible human remains in the area. As it is illegal to excavate any site where there are burials, underwater archaeologists had to use other techniques and tools. Experts use sonar and magnetometrics for their research and, after a year and a half, they are finally able to claim that the area less than an acre of extension, around of 4,000 square meters, was firm land not covered by the sea during the early Archaic period. Florida Secretary of State Ken Detzner said in a statement that the archaeological site called MKO is located on the continent shelf off the west coast of the state in what was once a freshwater lake when sea levels were much lower than at present. As the sea level rose, that lake was submerged by the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and covered by material known as peat. This is brown material consisting of partly decomposed vegetable matter, forming a deposit on acidic, boggy ground. This peat remained intact in the seabed, which helped preserve the ancient remains. According to Detzner, BAR archaeologists have done an incredible work of documentation and research that can help understand the native peoples better. 
The Secretary of State stressed that, out of respect for the individuals buried there and their possible alive descendants, divers and other persons are prohibited from assessing the site, already protected by the laws of Florida and controlled by representatives of the forces of order that perform frequent patrols. Timothy Parsons, director of the Historical Resources Division of the State Department, said that the MKO deposit is a revelation for the world of archaeology. Ryan Duggins, supervisor of underwater archaeology at the BAR, considered inspiring the fact that found the submerged field under the Gulf of Mexico so well prepared. We now know that this type of site exists on the continental shelf, said Duggins. On behalf of the Seminole people, Paul Backhouse, head of tribal historical conservation, expressed his satisfaction at being able to elaborate a plan with other institutions that will allow the ancestors to continue resting in peace without human interference for the next 7,000 years. We are truly humbled by this experience, Duggins explained in a statement. It's important to remember that this is a burial site and must be treated with the utmost respect. Life is strange sometimes. One minute you're just plowing your field and the next you're finding an ancient artifact on your own property. So it goes, right? At least that's how it happened for one farmer back in 1785. While working on his field, the farmer suddenly heard an odd noise, as if he'd run over something hard. Concerned, he decided to see what had caused the sound, but when he knelt down to take a closer look at the dirt, he spotted something that made his mouth drop. The farmer discovered a strange gold ring that he'd never seen before in his life. After picking it up and giving it a quick once-over, he had no idea that he'd potentially just found an artifact that would inspire some of the greatest stories ever told. First, he noted that the ring was a signet, which are used to make seals. It was engraved with the Latin phrase, Senecane vivus in die, which translates to, Senecus live well in God. It weighed 12 grams, about the same weight as a modern man's gold wedding band, and was designed to fit only on a gloved finger. Though the farmer didn't know it, the ring's origins could be traced back to the 4th century, when a Roman man named Silvanus visited the Celtic temple of Nodens, a healing god. As he bathed there, his ring was stolen by an unknown thief. Silvanus was said to have thought the burglar was a man he'd seen inside the temple named Senecus. In response to the alleged transgression, Silvanus supposedly cursed the man out of anger. After traveling some 100 miles away, it is believed that Senecus abandoned the ring in the town of Silchester, with no knowledge of this legend. The farmer who found it decided to keep the gold ring he'd found, hoping that one day he could sell it and become rich. Eventually, the farmer sold the ring to a family living at The Vine, a 16th century country manor house outside of Hampshire, who'd taken a particular interest in its origins. After making the purchase, however, it remained in their library untouched. It was largely forgotten about until many years later. In 1888, when the then owner of the home, Chandler Chute, wrote about the item, Meanwhile, a team of archaeologists were conducting a dig at the site of the old Nodens temple when they suddenly uncovered a plaque called Defixo, or Cursed Tablet, on it. The legend of Sylvanus and Senecus was detailed. Also inscribed on the tablet was a quote, which roughly translated to, For the god Nodens, Sylvanus has lost a ring and has donated one half of its worth to the Nodens. Among those named Senecus, permit no good health until his return to the temple of Nodens. Unable to verify the authenticity of this story, the tablet would sit in the estate's museum, untouched for several decades. In 1928, however, a young archaeologist named Mortimer Wheeler and his wife Tessa were brought to the site to examine it. They worked at the site for two years before their investigation eventually led them to the vine and the ring. The Wheelers sought the help in two Oxford University friends, whom they hoped could offer some insight into the story surrounding the ring. Remarkably, those men were none other than philosopher and archaeologist R. G. Collingwood and Celtic literature and Anglo-Saxon professor J. R. R. Tolkien. Naturally, it's rumored that the two years Tolkien spent researching Sylvanus, the thieving Senecus, and their cursed ring inspired him to write The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. In 2013, the vine ring was moved from the library and placed on permanent display at the manor, alongside a copy of the tablet and a first edition copy of The Hobbit. 
Thanks to their love of Tolkien's work, the Vine family is happy to teach visitors about the history of the original One Ring. What an incredible find that farmer made. It makes you wonder what sort of other artifacts are sitting out there waiting to be discovered. Unprecedented 7,000-year-old submerged archaeological site found off the coast of Florida. This will forever transform the way we approach offshore archaeology. An ancient burial site belonging to Native America culture has been found under the ocean near Key Minnesota, Minnesota Key Offshore, MKO, on the west coast of the Florida Peninsula, local Secretary of State Ken Detzner recently announced. The research carried out so far shows that during the early Archaic period, when the sea level was much lower than at present, the area where the K is located was not submerged and there was a small freshwater lake there where the ancient Floridians buried their deceased. The site near the community of Venice was first discovered by an amateur diver in June 2016, who reported the find to the Archaeological Research Office BAR, pointing towards the existence of possible human remains in the area. As it is illegal to excavate any site where there are burials, underwater archaeologists had to use other techniques and tools. Experts used sonar and magnetometrics for their research and, after a year and a half, they are finally able to claim that the area with less than an acre of extension, around of 4,000 square meters, was firm land not covered by the sea during the early Archaic period. Florida Secretary of State Ken Detzner said in a statement that the archaeological site called MKO is located on the continent shelf off the west coast of the state in what was once a freshwater lake when sea levels were much lower than at present. As the sea level rose, that lake was submerged by the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and covered by material known as peat. This is brown material consisting of partly decomposed vegetable matter, forming a deposit on acidic, boggy ground. This peat remained intact in the seabed, which helped preserve the ancient remains. According to Detzner, BAR archaeologists have done an incredible work of documentation and research that can help understand the native peoples better. The Secretary of State stressed that, out of respect for the individuals buried there and their possible alive descendants, divers and other persons are prohibited from assessing the site, already protected by the laws of Florida and controlled by representatives of the forces of order that perform frequent patrols. Timothy Parsons, director of the Historical Resources Division of the State Department, said that the MKO deposit is a revelation for the world of archaeology. Ryan Duggins, supervisor of underwater archaeology at the BAR, considered inspiring the fact that found the submerged field under the Gulf of Mexico so well prepared. We now know that this type of site exists on the continental shelf, said Duggins. On behalf of the Seminole people, Paul Backhouse, head of tribal historical conservation, expressed his satisfaction at being able to elaborate a plan with other institutions that will allow the ancestors to continue resting in peace without human interference for the next 7,000 years. We are truly humbled by this experience, Duggins explained in a statement. It's important to remember that this is a burial site and must be treated with the utmost respect. Several hundred fragments of ceramic vessels used by the Celts over 2,000 years ago have been discovered in Silesia in a well-preserved pottery kiln. The kiln belonged to one of the last of the Celtic groups in what is now Poland whose scientists believe emigrated south in the second half of the second century BC. The Celts lived from CA 400 to CA 120 BC in the lands of today's southern Poland in Lower Silesia near Wroclaw, in Malopolska near Krakow, and in Podkarpacy and on the Glubkseis Plateau. Lead researcher Dr. Pershemislaw Deliba from the Institute of Archaeology of the University of Wroclaw told PAP, the kiln consists of two chambers. Even a clay plate with holes, on which the fired vessels were placed, has survived to our times. This will allow us to carry out various analyses of production methods, it is a real treasure trove of knowledge on this subject. Almost all the vessels found in the area were made on a wheel. Until the arrival of the Celts in the territories of present-day Poland, this advanced technology of pottery production was unknown. The vessels are thin-walled, shiny and very carefully made. Some of them have an admixture of graphite, which made them resistant to high temperatures and acids. Dr. Deliba said, 
In the relics of huts in another part of this Celtic settlement, we also found handmade ceramic vessels, which were used every day. The ones extracted from the kiln were of much better quality. They were intended for use during more important events and probably served as so-called table ceramics. They were also placed in the graves of the deceased. According to the researchers, the kiln in Samboroas was operated by a highly specialized craftsman and the vessels were produced not only for its inhabitants but also for other nearby settlements of Celts. It is thought that the kiln was used by some of the last Celtic settlers in today's Polish lands. Around 120 BC, they went south together with the representatives of the Germanic tribes the Cimbri and the Teutons. The research in Samboroas is part of a larger research project by Dr. Deliba, whose aim is to trace ancient, long-distance trade routes. The researcher believes that the amber route leading from the Baltic Sea to Italy in the Roman period in the first centuries of our era was nothing new. It was to some extent inherited from the Celts. Scientists consider the Celts to be innovators. They introduced a number of solutions in the Polish lands, including the knowledge of turning vessels on a wheel and advanced metallurgy. They were the first to shoe horses, they popularized the saddle, and created the first chain mail. The first gold and silver coins found in the present-day Polish lands were also left by the Celts. Contrary to appearances, the cradle of the Celts is not Ireland and Great Britain but continental Europe. They spread throughout Europe in the middle of the first millennium BC from an area stretching north of the Alps, from Burgundy to the Bohemian Basin. Archaeologists recently unveiled newly discovered city ruins in central China, which reveal an ancient state dating back 5,300 years. The Zhengzhou Municipal Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology announced on Thursday in the capital city of Henan Province that the Shuangueishu site in Ganji, on the outskirts of Zhengzhou, was the site of a huge settlement. It was the highest level residential complex ever found of its time along the middle and lower reaches of the Yellow River. The ruins, with an area of 1.17 million square meters, light 2 kilometers south of the Yellow River at Shuangueishu in the township of Heliuo, Ganji City. The ruins are one of the largest tribal clusters of the middle and late phases of Yangshao culture, emerging around 7,000 years ago during the Neolithic age. Layers of ring trenches and city walls can still be spotted at the site, and more than 1,700 tombs have been uncovered that are neatly arranged into three blocks. Amid the residential areas, the remains of three sacrificial platforms stand as a reminder of ancient rituals. This location was carefully chosen, and its construction was well designed, says Wang Wei president of the Chinese Society of Archaeology. Discoveries in Shuangueishu have filled a gap in the research of the origins of Chinese civilization. The area where the Shuangueishu site is located, commonly known as Zhongyuan or the Central Plains, was traditionally recognized as a center of early-stage Chinese civilization. Previous discoveries in Henan include Erlitu, which is generally considered to be the site of the capital of the Xia dynasty, c. 21st century 16th century BC, Yingxu, the ruins of the last capital of the Shang dynasty, c. 16th century 11th century BC, and several other major cities of the two dynasties the beginning of China's united central kingship ruling a vast territory. Academics had believed the area rose as a cultural hub about 4,500 years ago. By the Liao River, in northeast China, and the central and lower reaches of the Yangtze River, we find high-level urban ruins which may be capitals of regional states from about 5,000 years ago, Wang says. Development of civilizations accelerated in these areas, but we had regretted that no such finding of the same period was made in the Zhongyuan area. For example, the Liangzhu archaeological ruins in eastern Zhejiang province dating back 5,300 years showed a highly developed rice-breeding agricultural civilization that worshipped jade. It was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site last year. We all know Zhongyuan is a core of ancient Chinese civilization, but how did it become the core, he says. We didn't have solid clues until now, in the Golden Age, when civilization started in China, this site likely played a key role. Archaeologists excavating in Chengdu, Sichuan province, have discovered over 6,000 ancient tombs spanning more than 2,000 years. The tombs date from various dynasties and were discovered during construction works for the Sichuan Xinchuan Innovation and Technology Park. Excavations began in 2015 
but the results of the ongoing discoveries have finally been announced by the Chengdu Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology. The tombs range from the Warring States period, 475 BC, the Qin Dynasty, 221-207 BC. Most of the tombs are carved into a small cliff face as rock pit tombs are constructed from brick and have contained tens of thousands of pieces of pottery, porcelain, copper, iron, glass, coins and stone artifacts. The team have also discovered cultural relics such as a gilt bronze knife, Buddha statues, painted figurines and painted miniature pottery houses. One notable discovery is a relatively well-preserved tomb from the late Han Dynasty, named the M94 Cliff Tomb, and contains 86 burial objects and hundreds of coins. Zhuo Zhikiang, an associate researcher at the Chengdu Institute of Cultural Relics and Archaeology said. The tomb will help us to construct the archaeological cultural sequence and the funeral behaviors, rituals, and concepts of the Shudia tombs in the late Han Dynasty and the Three Kingdoms period.